Hello, my name is Phil Radebush. I'm an Extension Master Gardener volunteer in Buncombe County. Today we'd like to talk about controlling nuisance wildlife in the garden and landscape with a focus specifically on voles and moles. Voles and moles are often confused with each other because they're both small, dark colored mammals and they have somewhat similar common names. However, there are two distinct groups of animals that can be difficult to manage when they do cause problems in your garden and landscape. So today we'd like to talk about the physical and behavioral differences between voles and moles and hopefully provide you with some ideas about how to control each of these nuisance wildlife. There are a set of notes or a handout that accompanies this presentation and I encourage you to download and print that off. It contains most of the key information that we're going to talk about today. First, a disclaimer. The brand names and pictures of products appearing in this presentation are for product identification or educational purposes only. No endorsement is intended, nor is criticism implied of similar products not mentioned. So we've made the lawyers happy. But before we talk about voles and moles individually, I want to kind of point you to some additional resources that might be helpful in dealing with not only the voles and moles, but also a nuisance wildlife in general. The first is the North Carolina Extension Gardener Handbook, which is available to purchase as a hardbound book, or you can find individual chapters that are available to download on the Cooperative Extension North Carolina website. There is a chapter in the handbook, chapter 20, on wildlife which discusses not only voles and moles, but other nuisance wildlife. And that's a good starting point as an additional resource. The North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission has an excellent website that I use as a resource commonly. It's easy to remember. It's nckwildlife.org. And I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. If you need some additional information about voles and moles that aren't covered in this presentation, there are a couple of good extension products. The University of Maryland has an excellent fact sheet on voles. And if you just search on Maryland Extension Fact Sheet 654, you should be able to find that. Virginia Cooperative Extension has an excellent publication on moles. If you just search Virginia Extension, publication 420-201, you should be able to find that. We're going to mention a few repellents that might be used for voles and moles, but if you want more information about repellents for nuisance wildlife, there is a repellent video that appears on the Buncombe Extension website, the Master Gardener page, and would encourage you to watch that video about repellents. Again, in North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, ncwildlife.org is an excellent resource for information about wildlife in general. They have a section that's called Have a Wildlife Problem? Question mark. It has information about injured or orphaned wildlife, which is not the focus today, a section on preventing wildlife conflicts, and then wildlife species information about individual species that includes their range map, an overview of each species. If you have a problem with that particular wildlife species, what problems might occur, then some general information about management strategies, including trapping, relocation, hunting, and other management options. So I would encourage you to visit that website. It's an excellent wildlife resource. When we talk about managing moles and voles, we're going to talk about it from a concept of integrated pest management, or IPM. A pest is really defined as any unwanted living organism. So pests can range all the way from microscopic organisms like bacteria and fungi to quite large organisms like bear and elk and deer. So certainly voles and moles fit the definition of a pest. I like to think of IPM as a pyramid. And at the base of the pyramid is where we would like to focus most of our management options, things that are going to help prevent nuisance wildlife issues. These are generally more benign because they're going to involve cultural mechanisms. Next, we're going to talk about mechanical or physical management options, biological options, and then at the top, chemical options, or in the case of nuisance wildlife, sometimes we're going to be talking about 
lethal options. As we go up the pyramid, the intervention levels increase and the toxicity to both the organism and the environment increase. So we will really be focusing a lot of our attention about integrated pest management options at the bottom of the IPM pyramid. We're first going to talk about voles. Here's a picture of the two most common voles that we deal with, the woodland or pine vole and the meadow vole. Voles are herbivores. So they prefer to eat green vegetation, roots, and tubers. They also like to chew on bark to get to the cambium, which is the tissue layer that's right under the bark that provides cells for plant growth, but is also highly nutritious to gnawing animals or rodents, such as voles. They have a very high metabolic activity, which means that they have a voracious appetite and, and they prefer to eat all the time. They're active day and night, year round. We really see increasing problems with voles as we incorporate natural areas into our landscapes. Meadow voles prefer grassy habitats where they construct complex networks of surface runways. They're sometimes called meadow mouses or a field mouse. And this is really a misnomer. We'll talk about mice here in just a minute. The woodland or pine vole, uh, also sometimes called the pine mouse, Again, that common name is a little bit misleading because they don't necessarily prefer pine woods to other woodland areas. Woodland voles prefer living underground. They construct extensive tunnels and burrows with entrance holes that are usually about an inch to an inch and a half in diameter. It's generally smaller than the holes that are made by chipmunks and some other nuisance wildlife. I wanted to show the skeleton of a vole because it tells you a couple of different things. One is they have a very large head. Again, mature adults are about five to seven inches in length. They have a stocky body, short legs, relatively short tail, certainly shorter than, than mice, and a gray chestnut brown to black hair color. What really stands out is the large head. And you can see the very sharp incisors, both on the upper and the lower jaw. Again, these are true rodents and they need to gnaw all the time. And that large head tells you that they have very powerful chewing muscles. So if we combine their high metabolic activity, which means they need to eat all the time, the fact that they're rodents, so they need to gnaw or chew, the fact they have very strong muscles in the head, you can see that they can potentially set up to cause lots of problems. And the woodland or pine vole primarily lives underground, so in general, it will cause below ground damage to plant material, whereas the meadow vole prefers grassy habitats at the surface, and so in general, they cause above ground damage, although there can be some crossover depending on habitat where they're located. So let's just step back a minute and talk about mice, because again, voles are frequently a miss identified as mice. These are the three species that you're most likely to find in your garden or landscape, the white-footed or wood mouse, the eastern harvest mouse, and the deer mouse. Mice are omnivores versus voles, which are strictly herbivores. So not only will the plant material they prefer to eat be seeds and fruits and insects and worms and, and slugs and other animals as well, so they rarely damage plants. They might get into your storage shed and eat seeds and damage seeds, but they rarely damage plants. Mice are generally about the same size, but they're more slender than voles. They have a smaller head. They have larger ears. They have a much longer tail, usually the same length or longer than their body. And generally they'll have white feet, legs, or a white belly underneath uh, compared to the darker voles. So what do we look for to see if we have vole activity in our gardens or landscapes? As I said earlier, meadow voles prefer grassy habitats where they construct complex networks of surface runways. Oftentimes, as pictured here, you can see the runways in turf grass or in pastures or meadows of adjacent property. In the wintertime, you'll also see these 
after a snow that has persisted for a week or two, when that snow melts, you'll see these runways that have been constructed between the surface of the grass and the underneath surface of the snow. Woodland voles prefer living underground where they construct extensive tunnels and burrows. Sometimes you can see evidence of that. You see here where two paving stones have been pulled up and these shallow burrows are probably most consistent with woodland voles. You may actually find entrance tunnels. Generally these are about one to one and a half inches in diameter. This one actually was near a blueberry plant that was suffering from vole damage to the roots. To see if that entrance is active, you can do what's called the apple sign test. We'll show a picture of that a little bit later in the presentation. You basically take a slice of apple, put it by this entrance hole, cover the apple with a plastic plant container, put a brick on top of that so it doesn't get knocked over, check that every one or two days, and if you see that the apple has been chewed on or it's been completely eaten, then that is probably an active burrow. As I said earlier, they have a high metabolic activity. They're rodents with a need to gnaw. They're oftentimes active during the fall and winter, so you're going to see gnawing damage on trees, on shrubs. Again, they like to eat the growing tissue or cambium that's right underneath the bark. On the other hand, woodland voles have a tendency to cause damage below ground, so you'll see them gnawing and chewing on roots and tubers and corms. Again, this can occur any time of year. What do we do to manage vole issues that we might have? So again, we're going to look at this from an integrated pest management standpoint, and we're going to start at the bottom of the pyramid. We're going to talk about some cultural things that can be done. So the first thing is we're all familiar now with COVID-19 with the terminology of social distancing. That's certainly something I think we can apply to vole management as well. Voles are predated by many animals. They are essentially at the bottom of the food chain. So fox and coyotes and snakes and hawks and owls, all kinds of other creatures uh, prefer uh, to eat on voles. So they really don't like open spaces. If you can maintain mowed turf grass or a large xeriscape with gravel, something around plantings will help deter them from entering the garden or landscape. As I said before, I lived for many years on a 40-acre property of which 35 acres was pasture. And I had many, many meadow voles in that pasture, but I never had problems in my garden or in the plantings around my house because there was a border of turf grass that I mowed on a regular basis. So just think again that these voles are at the bottom of the food chain. They don't like open spaces and anything you can do culturally will help prevent them from entering your landscape. This picture shows a couple of good things and maybe not so good things when it comes to vole management. First of all, you can see that the shrubbery and trees are placed far apart. This is a good, it doesn't create an area where the vole can hide and they prefer not to be in open spaces. The thing that isn't so good is you can see that the mulch is coming right up against the trees and against the shrubs. What we'd like to do is pull that mulch back so it's at least a foot away from the trunks of the shrubbery and the trees and that open space will prevent or inhibit the voles from coming right up to the plant. This is a picture for the front of my town home. In this townhome, when it was built, they planted cherry laurels and carissa holly in the front. I haven't done anything to thin it out. The plantings are about 12 years old, and I've seen the meadow voles come and go from behind the shrubbery. They haven't caused any other problems that I know of in my landscape, but I know that this is a place that they probably like to, to hide and may even be living there. So again, anything you can do to prevent uh, dense plantings maintain open spaces is probably better. Avoid using landscape fabric as a weed barrier. It's a perfect place for meadow voles to hide between the fabric barrier and the mulch that you put on top. And the woodland vole really love to live underneath the fabric because again it provides a really nice barrier 
between them and their tunnels. And if you can avoid using landscape fabric as a weed barrier, that's probably helpful as part of your bowl management strategy. Hardware cloth around trees or shrubs, a mesh of a quarter inch or less. You do need to bury the wire at least six inches deep. You're trying to prevent both meadow and woodland bull damage. And you've seen a couple of pictures here of the hardware cloth. In addition to putting hardware cloth around the stem, you probably want to pull that mulch back about a foot. And then again, kind of creating gravel or some other barrier several inches wide, as shown here, may be helpful. There's a product called Permatil. It's actually an expanded slate aggregate material that is mined here in North Carolina. Then it's heated to a very high temperature, and you can see here what it looks like. The manufacturer recommends using this not only to improve the soil texture, but you can use it to create what they call a vole block barrier. I have not used this personally for voles, but I do know gardening colleagues that have and think it is beneficial. If you're interested in this, you can go to the Permatil website and they have some additional information about using their product to create a barrier to voles. Another product that might be used is diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth are the fossilized remains of diatoms that are mined. If you use this for gardening purposes, you want to use one that's called food grade quality. There are lower qualities that are used for swimming pool filters and, and other uses. We usually recommend diatomaceous earth for controlling soft-bodied insects and snails and slugs. You can sprinkle it around plants. You can sprinkle it on the plant itself. And there might be use for it for mixing in the soil for vole control. As we move up the pyramid, we get to biological control. As I said, voles are at the bottom of the food chain. So anything we can do to encourage predators to be in our yards and landscapes might be helpful. One example of that would be the eastern rat snake, sometimes called the black snake. We also think about garter snakes and anything else we can do to encourage predators to visit our yard. Many people don't like snakes and they want to get rid of them or kill them, but snakes are really a gardener's friend. I would encourage if you see these uh, to leave them alone and hopefully they will help control the problem. There are some terrier type dogs that are also natural hunters or predators. For many years I had miniature schnauzers and my miniature schnauzers loved hunting voles and moles, so I encouraged them to do that. And finally, the top of the pyramid, we have chemical or lethal management options. I mentioned earlier the apple sign test. If you see a burrow entrance and you want to know if it's active, take a slice of apple and put it under a plastic gardening container, put a brick on top, check it every day or two. If you see that the apple has been eaten, then you know that's an active burrow and that's where you might want to use snap traps. There are other bait station systems that can be purchased that are lethal as well. You can also use anticoagulant toxicants that are used for control of mice and rats. They may also be effective against voles. In general, repellents are not effective but those products that contain decaying animal protein, such as egg or slaughterhouse waste, such as blood or high levels of capsaicin, which is in the hot sauce products, uh, appear to work best. If you want more information about repellents, I encourage you to watch the repellent video that's on the Master Gardener website. So let's move on and talk about moles. Moles are different. They are physically different, although they're often confused with voles. There are three species of moles that occur in North Carolina, but the one that is the most common and causes most of the problems is the eastern mole. They're distinguished from voles by having a hairless pointed snout, and no visible ears, very small eyes, and broad, powerful forefeet with a very prominent digging claws that oftentimes appear to be webbed. They are different 
than voles and that they are not herbivores but carnivores. So they most commonly will eat insects, including grubs, ants, beetles, snails, slugs, and earthworms. They tunnel, they cause problems by tunneling in managed turf, and any damage to other vegetation is really due to their digging efforts. They're not specifically consuming that vegetative manner. Again, they tunnel in turf, and they can burrow as much as 150 to 300 feet per day. And they make runways that are shallow, burrows right underneath the surface, and that's what we'll see in the yard or in the athletic field or other areas of turf. And these may or may not be used again because these are primarily feeding tunnels. They may also have deeper tunnels that are reused as pathways between their nesting area and their feeding grounds. And they'll usually nest under logs or stumps or boulders. And I used to have moles that would frequently nest underneath my compost pile. And you may also see mole hills where they've created an entrance on the surface. But what can we do to manage mole issues? Again, we're thinking about the bottom of the IPM pyramid. So what are some cultural things we can do? Well, one thing is moles really enjoy eating grubs. And so if we have a lawn grub problem, we can keep lawn grub populations reduced. And you can look at some additional resources and, and information about how to identify and control grubs in your turf grass. But moles also avoid heavy clay soil, very wet soil, a stony, coarse, gravelly soils, anything where they Will have difficulty in tunneling. And so another way is if we, on a regular basis, use irrigation or watering in our turf grass, we can actually reduce the soil moisture by not irrigating or sprinkling as often, and that may discourage the moles from living in that turf grass. From a mechanical or physical measure, you can pack down the soil where the surface tunnels are evident. Uh, you're unlikely to kill a mole doing that or cause a big disruption in their lifestyle. But when my children were younger, they really enjoyed going out and stomping on the tunnels, and certainly that's something you can try. You can also, for high-value garden beds, create a perimeter barrier of either sheet metal or hardware cloth needs to go to a depth of about 12 to 15 inches and about 10 to 12 inches horizontally. You can put that around a high value bed to keep the moles from burrowing there. Biological control is going to be very similar for moles as it was for voles. My miniature schnauzers enjoyed looking for moles and especially knew that they could hunt around the compost pile where their nest was. Again, black snakes, a variety of mammals, coyotes, fox, will be predators for the mole. If you haven't seen the video of a blue heron hunting for moles, I would encourage you to go out in YouTube and just search on blue heron moles. You'll see some wonderful videos of blue herons hunting and catching and eating moles. I had a water garden and the blue heron would come and they would try to eat my goldfish and would certainly eat the frogs in my water garden. I never could figure out how to get him to hunt for the moles in the yard. At the top of the IPM pyramid are going to be chemical or lethal methods. There are some approved and registered mole toxicants or poisons but they're probably best used by a licensed or certified vendor. So you might want to contact them. Repellents are generally not effective, but those products that contain castor oil and turf fungicide may be helpful. Thiurum is a fungicide primarily used to control fungal problems in turf grass, but it also appears to have some mole repellent activity. I have not used castor oil or thiurum because generally I was dealing with mole problems on an area that was two or three acres in size and it was just cost prohibitive to use those. But certainly repellents might work if you have a small area of turf grass with moles. Spear type traps can be placed over active tunnels, usually one or two traps per average yard. These are 
easily found in most garden stores and large box stores and they can be used successfully if placed over active tunnels. There are many mole repellent myths and none of these have really been shown to be effective. Chewing gum, hair, bleach, razor blades, thorny rose branches, broken glass and other sharp objects have been recommended to place in mole tunnels but none of these have been found to be very effective. There are a variety of electronic magnetic or vibrating devices on the market to place in the yard. None of these have been shown to be consistently effective. Grain baits and what are called mole worms, which are poisons placed in artificial earthworms, are recommended. But again, moles hunt by sensing motion or vibration and they'll only eat grain bait or these the mole worms as a last resort and probably not very effective. And finally there's the mole plant also called caper spurge that supposedly will keep moles away. They have not been found to be effective. And in fact most people that I know of that have planted mole plants they've done that in their landscapes because they think they're controlling moles when they really have a bowl problem. So the mole plant or caper spurge has not been shown to be effective for controlling either moles or voles. Hopefully you've learned a little bit of something about the physical and behavioral differences between voles and moles. We've talked a little bit about taking an integrative pest management concept and applying that to each of the animals. Again, the more you can do at the bottom of the pyramid using cultural, mechanical, physical, and biological methods oftentimes will be more effective than trying repellents or lethal intervention. If you need more help or questions beyond what's in this presentation, you're encouraged to contact the wildlife resources that we talked about earlier. You can also call the Garden Helpline between March and October or email your questions to bunkummg at gmail.com. The nice thing about using the Gmail or the email account is that you can include pictures of pests or plants or plant damage and you can get your questions more efficiently answered. Thanks for joining us. Happy gardening.